I'm Gerald Keneally and welcome to a very different Timor time. This year we meet online to commemorate and celebrate the past, present and future of Timor-Leste. This week we hear from Paul Cleary, a journalist, advocate and author of the book The Men Who Came Out of the Ground. That story is the one about the 2nd 2nd Commando Unit which was one of the first Australian commando units who served on the island of Timor in 1942. Men like my late father, Paddy Keneally, was a soldier in the 2nd 2nd Commando Unit that served in Timor at that time. The Australian soldiers established a strong bond between themselves and the local Timorese. Atlas was formed in honour of those who served in Timor and those 60,000 Timorese who lost their lives during the time of the Japanese occupation and their crime, protecting the Australian soldiers from the Japanese. And I first became interested in East Timor's struggle in the mid-1990s when I was working as a political journalist in Canberra and there was a lot of discussion there about the uh, oppression faced by the uh, Timorese people. I went and travelled there in 1997 while it was Indonesian occupied and uh, it was a pretty scary place. It was a really full-on military occupation. When I was working in East Timor in the mid-2000s, it was the first time I really became aware that Australia had this military involvement during the Second World War and I had the opportunity to meet some of the uh, amazing uh, veterans who were still very much alive and kicking. Uh, Paddy Keneally was one of them and their great love for the Timorese people and the, the great debt that they believed that they owed the Timorese and uh, that really got me interested in just what had gone on in, in the Second World War and uh, after returning to Australia and I decided to, to look into that history and I was amazed to learn just what an incredible battle it was that, that they waged uh, against overwhelming odds and they only could do that because of the support of the Timorese people and a small number of Portuguese as well. So what's interesting about Australia's involvement in Portuguese Timor in 1942 is that uh, Portugal at the time was neutral and uh, Australia along with Dutch forces actually invaded Portuguese Timor. We landed troops there against the wishes of the government in Lisbon. Looking back at the history of the Second World War, it clearly shows that the Axis powers were wanting to stay away from neutral territories. The Japanese had no intention of invading Portuguese Timor because they didn't want to bring a neutral uh, power into that conflict. And so Australia's preemptive landing of troops there in December 1941 had this knock-on effect of forcing the Japanese to change their plans to invade that territory and that then had really disastrous consequences for the Timorese people leading to uh, a very significant death, death toll something in the order of 40 to 50,000 Timorese dying as a result of what became a scorched earth policy that the Japanese uh, rolled out across Timor. At that point, the uh, Australian command realised that this was becoming very costly to keep the Australian forces in Timor, and so they decided to withdraw them. But that then still led to even more disastrous consequences for the Timorese because now there was no one there to protect them. And so this then led to even greater loss of life and greater destruction of the country. I think one of the most extraordinary Good Samaritan acts of the Second World War occurred right there in Dili and it was after an Australian soldier by the name of Keith Hayes was lined up for execution by the side of the road just after he'd been captured and he was shot and bayoneted along with three of his mates but incredibly he survived his wounds and he was taken back to a village and looked after by a middle-aged woman by the name of Donna Berta Martins. She cared for Keith for a period of maybe 10 days or two weeks. It's not known exactly, but she looked after him in her little hut. She'd wrap him up in a blanket if she'd hear the Japanese patrols coming around. And she tended to his wounds. She used mud packs to treat them, traditional medicine. And uh, after a period when he was strong enough to, to move again, she managed to get him onto a Timor pony and a couple of Timorese men took him up into the mountains and returned him 
back to his mates, to the, to the doctor, and he was then able to be sent home to Australia. And uh, it's just an incredible story, the risks that she took. And had she been found out, she would most certainly been uh, in great trouble with the Japanese. She may have even been killed herself. So it is an incredible example, I think, of the extent to which the Timorese were willing to go out of their way and to look after our men in their uh, greatest hour of need. Well, one of the great tragedies, I think, about Timor-Leste and the way it was invaded uh, in 1975 by Indonesia was that Australia quickly forgot about that debt of honour. When Tragically, in the 1970s, when uh, instability emerged in Timor, that uh, Australians, particularly those in power and those in the federal government, really had no knowledge of this important historical episode and, and what it meant for Australia strategically in the Second World War. And so Timor in the time of the Cold War was seen as a, a potentially uh, unstable territory that could be orchestrated by communist influence. There was all sorts of stories going around about how it could become a little Cuba on Australia's doorstep and Indonesia was very much anti-communist as well. So Australia and Indonesia really formed a single view and that was that an independent Timor was a very bad idea. That created an opportunity for Indonesia to step in and to invade, which they did on the 7th of December 1975. And unfortunately at the time, Prime Minister Gough Whitlam had a view that this wasn't a, such a bad idea and his words to President Suharto were that the Australian public would not support an, the use of force or the words along those lines to gain control of Timor. He didn't actually say the Australian government. So the Australian government's view, I think, was and they were willing to turn a blind eye to, uh, to the use of force, which I think is a, a real shame on Australia's part that we so willing to betray this important ally of ours and these great people who had stood by us in our hour of great need. I was working in the Canberra Press Gallery as a journalist at the time when Shinana Guzmao was captured. And I remember at the time uh, there was a foreign affairs correspondent who was very much of the, the DFAT view of the world, very much of the sort of pro-Indonesian view that a lot of journalists in Canberra had at the time. And I remember him saying, oh, that's it, it's, it's all over for the Timorese. Gushmao has been captured and so that's it. But really the struggle wasn't over because the Timorese people kept on demanding their right for freedom, their right for a ballot on their independence. And so that pressure was kept up and that really continued right through into 1991. And that tragically led to the massacre at the Santa Cruz Cemetery, which was really about the Indonesians trying to stamp out those demands for freedom and for independence. And it just goes to show that even when uh, you lose someone like Gujmao, that the Timorese people, even the kids, it's still at school who they were, mostly in that demonstration and, and the people who were killed, really just weren't going to take that lying down. And I think that is a real testament to the fact that the, the desire for freedom and independence wasn't just something that was the elites. It wasn't just a, a few of the big guys that you sometimes find in a lot of Southeast Asian countries. It was something that trickled all the way down to the school kids, to the ordinary people, that they really desperately wanted independence. And thankfully, though, it was filmed. And as a result of that, the world really for the first time got to see what was actually happening inside that country and what had gone on for the past 24 years. Timor is, uh, despite being a small country, it's actually very diverse. And I suppose that's part of the reason, partly because of the topography. It's a very rugged uh, landscape. It's, uh, so it's got lots of interesting communities. And so there is a lot going on, though, in terms of Australian communities setting up sister city or, or friendship um, networks in Timor and so I really encourage people just to go and find that little part of Timor that 
really uh, sort of takes your fancy and that you think is uh, an amazing part of the world. Some of what you've probably learned about Atlas and what, what they're doing and hopefully when tourism opens up again, people will be able to go there and really discover a pretty unique part of the world. It does really have that interesting history of 400 years of Portuguese influence so close to Australia. And it's a part of the world that I think Australians really, uh, given the history and given what we owe the team Marie's, that uh, we all have an obligation the way to get to know the place better. Melbourne Orphanage. Since Atlas's formation in 2014, Atlas has provided funding for the Orphanage Food Program, providing rice and other necessities for the children. The St. Therese Orphanage at Malbara is under the care of the Carmelite Sisters. The Orphanage houses children from infants to age 12. Some of these children attend the local school. In 2016, Atlas undertook a bold project to build a new kitchen for the Orphanage to improve cooking and hygiene. This project was completed in 2017. Atlas continues to support the Carmelite Sisters in the care and education of orphan children by providing funding on a quarterly basis. Atlas representatives and friends who visit the orphanage all speak of it as a home, a friendly welcoming place where children are happy and at ease, where they have a safe place to live and are provided with nourishing food, health care and education. There are, at present, 32 children living at the orphanage. These children attend kindergarten and primary school in the local area. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to contribute financially to this Atlas project, please visit our website to make a donation. There's a number of ways you can support Atlas, none of which involve money. Visit our website, atlas.org.au and subscribe to our email newsletter. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Atlas East Timor. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Atlas East Timor. Thank you for your continued support.